Welcome to the diagnostic webinar series. This webinar is on cryptococcal antigen testing, and I'm going to take you through various aspects of this in the next few minutes. The learning objectives I'll cover in a minute. We're going to deal with how we diagnose cryptococcal meningitis and other forms of cryptococcal disease. We're going to show you how the kits are done and the actual procedures related to those, and then how to interpret titers that are positive for cryptococcus, and in particular, the quantification of those titers. So our learning objectives today are to understand how cryptococcal meningitis is diagnosed, to understand how to perform antigen testing using several different kits, including a lateral flow device, and then be able to interpret the results for clinicians in the different clinical contexts in which these tests are done. So as I'm sure you know, cryptococcal disease particularly affects the lungs and brain. The organism is breathed in and then may disseminate to multiple organs, but cryptococcal meningitis is the most common manifestation. Sometimes you can have cryptococcal skin lesions as well, and these are actually more frequently found in histoplasmosis or talomycosis than cryptococcus infection, but they do occur in cryptococcal disease, and sometimes you have subcutaneous lesions. Most patients present with a full-blown central nervous system infection or meningitis. Occasionally you can have limited disease to the skin, the prostate, the eyes, the bones or the joints, or a combination of those different organisms. Disseminated cases are often seen in severely immunocompromised individuals, particularly HIV and AIDS and transplant patients, but it's also seen in people without any apparent immune deficiency. So cryptococcal meningitis is diagnosed using multiple different methods, and today we're going to focus on the antigen method because that's the most sensitive and the easiest means of establishing the diagnosis. In some lesions, particularly skin lesions, but also in bone lesions or other biopsies, you can directly see cryptococcal yeast cells. And that's particularly true in the spinal fluid using an India ring stain, where cryptococcal yeast cells are quite easily visible. And you may occasionally see daughter cells attached to the larger mother cell. Patients with cryptococcal pneumonia have abnormalities in their chest x-ray or CT scan, which can be quite variable but include uh, cavitation and nodules. Once a specimen has been taken, cultures may grow. These do grow on blood agar, but they're better grown on specific fungal media, particularly saprobes media. And when an organism is grown, it can then be identified as a yeast. Further tests can be done to establish what the species of cryptococcus is. Sometimes a biopsy is done, and cryptococcal organisms are visible on a biopsy, best visualised with specific fungal stains such as amoyenethylene silver or PAS stains, but they are occasionally visible on H&E, essentially as an organism with a halo around it because the capsule doesn't stain. Another means of identifying the organism is through molecular or Molditoff identification systems, which we won't go into in any detail in this webinar. So the key specimens and approaches to making a full diagnosis of cryptococcal disease and assessing which organs are affected includes a spinal fluid and an India ink stain is less sensitive than a cryptococcal antigen test, but it is a helpful test because if yeast are seen, then the diagnosis is clear. Fungal culture is important, but takes some time. There are clinical studies which have shown that quantitative fungal cultures are very helpful in monitoring a response to antifungal therapy. If there is a skin lesion, then a biopsy, or sometimes a scrape from the surface of the biopsy, can be done with fungal staining, and that can be cultured on fungal media. In the blood, cryptococcus may grow in the blood, it may be mistaken for candidemia, and that's important because the kinocandins are inactive against cryptococcus. Cryptococcal antigen can be done, and it can be quantified in the blood as well. Occasionally, urine or seminal fluid can grow cryptococcus, and that's helpful for assessing patients who may have prostate disease. And respiratory cultures are sometimes positive as well in patients with cryptococcal pneumonia, which can be as a sole disease or as part of a disseminated disease. So the sample types that grow cryptococcus are typically spinal fluid, blood, and skin biopsy, are sometimes respiratory fluids. Most of the time, cryptococcus can be isolated in patients with cryptococcal meningitis, but the antigen test is more sensitive than culture. Blood cultures are positive in 35 to 70% of patients with cryptococcal meningitis overall. 
The best temperatures for incubating cultures are 30 to 35 degrees on multiple media. It's not a difficult organism to grow, but it can take two to five days to come up. The colonies are white, green, mucoid, almost milky coloured colonies. And then they, over time, turn orange, tan or brown, and they produce melanin, uh, typically. They're grown in aerobic culture. This organism doesn't grow well in anaerobic culture. And you have to keep the plates for at least five days, and preferably up to four weeks, to be sure the critical hole cultures are negative, although the vast majority of isolates will grow in five days. Bird seed agar is useful specifically to separate Canada from Cryptococcus because the colonies of Cryptococcus go black on bird seed agar, whereas the Canada colonies do not. If an avalin glycine bromothymol blue, agar can be used for distinguishing the gatti from the near formans varieties or species of Cryptococcus. And there's better encapsulation on chocolate media than there is on bird agar. Microscopy can be done principally on spinal fluid, but sometimes on other secretions, or for example, for an aspiration for an abscess next to a bone. India ink or microsanic can be used as the background stain, and encapsulated elongated yeast cells called plastocnidia racine. That's the most rapid method of identification. India ink is positive in 70 to 80 percent of patients with cryptococcal meningitis but only 30 to 50% of HIV negative individuals with cryptococcal meningitis. And patients who have persistently positive inderings on treatment, this signifies treatment failure usually. So it can be a helpful, a helpful test, but it does take quite a long time to clear inderink microscopy positive, in, particularly in patients with HIV disease who have very high numbers of cryptococci in the spinal fluid. Patients with HIV sometimes have cryptococci with very small capsules and they can look like lymphocytes and sometimes there are more cryptococci than lymphocytes and that can be a misleading image microscopically. And as I've indicated, indirect is less sensitive than cryptococcal antigen. On tissue, cryptococcal yeasts have a narrow-based bud, unlike blastomyces, for example, and PAS stain produces a, quite a marked pink colour and as does Musicarmin, which is a specialised stain for Cryptococcus, which is used occasionally. occasionally. Cryptococci also produce melanin, and that can be visualised on the Fontana Manassan stain. If you use direct microscopy with Calcofluor or Blancofluor, this organism also has a bright capsule, which can be visualised with these fluorescent brighteners. The differential diagnoses Histologically, a histoplasma, which is usually a smaller than Cryptococcus, being three to five uh, microns across. But Histoplasma duboisii, or the organism causing African histoplasmosis, is a, quite a bit larger. And they do have narrow budding yeast cells. Candida gabrata is usually a small yeast, but can be larger, up to 15 microns. And there are no pseudohyphae seen with that. And pseudohyphae are very rare with Cryptococcus. So the antigen test depends upon the release of carbohydrate from the cell surface in the cell capsule, and it can be done on multiple specimens, serum or plasma, finger prick, a whole blood, spinal fluid, urine, although it's less sensitive in urine, and BAL, or bronchoscopy fluid. It can be used as a, both a screening test and as a diagnostic tool. The sensitivity with latex agglutination is between 93 and 100% and specificity is quite high, 93 to 98%. The lateral flow assays, which have been principally done in HIV patients, are at least 99% sensitive and they're highly specific as well. And those figures relate to serum plasma, whole blood and spinal fluid. In urine, the sensitivity is about 85%. There are false positives, usually at low level, and these include rheumatoid factor, the organism trichosporin, which is a cause of fungemia, particularly in cancer patients, produces an almost identical antigen and gives you a true positive result, but it's false positive for cryptococcus. And there are a few other organisms that can produce a low level false positive, including stomatococcus, mucinaginosis, klebsiella infections, and a or plasmaresis-like fluid can also give you a false positive.
In the older late excavation assays, there were prozone effects where very high antigen titers would produce a false negative. And there are patients with extremely low levels of cryptococcal antigen, particularly non-immunocompromised patients who have a chronic hydrocephalus presentation. And these can be false negative, particularly on late excavation. And poorly encapsulated or encapsulated strains have lower levels of antigen, but it's usually still positive. So the advantages of the cryptococcal antigen assay using the LFA methodology is that you have a fast turnaround time. It doesn't take very much laboratory equipment, so it can be done at the bedside if necessary, or serum or plasma can be centrifuged and then the sample run. There's no pre-treatment of the sample required. The test is stable at room temperature, including quite high temperatures in the tropics, and it covers both the Cryptococcus neoformans and the GATI antigen. It's important because there are occasional patients with GATI infections who otherwise were missed on some of the older tests. It's not quantitative in the first generations of the LFA tests, but the more recent ones have got a, a double band which show two different levels of positivity. And if the higher test is positive, then that usually means the patient has meningitis. There are these older tests. Here's an example of the Meridian Late Excavation Test, which was the standard test for several decades and is still used and is helpful, but not quite as sensitive as the LFA test. But it does produce a quantitative answer. It's not as easy to generate reproducible results because of the dilution issues that have to be very carefully done, and particularly patients with a very large amount of antigen. There are EIA tests. So this is an example of the IMI EIA test, which gives you a, an OD or an ELISA reader. And there's an alternative from Meridian with a different EIA. And there are other companies with EIA tests as opposed to late excavation tests. So we're going to show you a number of different procedures uh, from different tests that are available currently. There is a move to have dual titer antigen tests, and not all of these have been fully exemplified and launched into the market. So it's important to keep up to date with new developments in this area over time. But this introduction will be very helpful, I think, in showing you how simple these tests are. To remind you, a lateral flow test is quite carefully built, and the bottom panel here on this image you can see you have a test line and a control line which are detecting the first antigen from the infection you're interested in, and the control line just to check that the sample has flowed correctly down the, uh, the pad and the test is actually working in a functional way. And if you look at the middle image, you can see that you have a sample pad and that's where the sample goes and then it gradually migrates down through the test, and then it's absorbed in the wadding pad at the, at the far end. And the top example shows you exactly what happens. So the clinical sample goes on the pad. There are monoclonal antibodies linked to colloidal gold. There they bind to cryptococcal antigen if it's present, and then those are detected as the sample, and these conjugates move further down by the test line. And there's a similar event happening with the control line with a different structure of gold and control positive sample. So now you're going to hear about the Biosynex Crypto PS test, which is a semi quantitative LFA. Biosynex Crypto PS assay can be used on all blood, serum, plasma, or spinal fluid. When you open the box, you'll find inside all the reagents that you need apart from pipette tips and pipetta. And you should read the instructions for use before you do the assay if you haven't done it before. There's a barcode card present. Each of the cassettes is individually wrapped uh, in an aluminium pouch and you will find two bottles of liquid, one which is a diluent bottle for, for doing titrations, and the other which is the diluent dropper bottle for running each assay. And there's also a positive control bottle if you want to do a positive control to check on the results. So 
in this example, plasma is going to be used. You take an individual cassette and you remove it from its pouch and you place it on the bench in front of you. You then use a pipetta that allows you to pipette 20 microliters. And you take your sample, which you vortex prior to insertion into the S-well of the cassette. And then you take the dropper bottle and you add three drops of the diluent into the same uh, S well of the assay. You start the timer for 10 minutes and you can see that you could get three lines. You should have a control line and you can have a low concentration positive or a high concentration positive. The test should be read at 10 minutes and not at 15 minutes. This example is a low level positive. The next assay that we're going to show you is the Dynamica LFA, which is available in many countries. In this video, we demonstrate how to perform Dynamica cryptococcal antigen lateral flow assay, also known as CRAG LFA, to perform the test. Ensure that you have pipetta 100 microliter or 200 microliter. Tips Timer Tube rack 1. Open the kit and take out test card from the foil pouch. Please test cards on flight and clean bench. 2. Add 80 microliter of serum or CSF samples into sample pad. 3. Read and record the result after 15 minutes. Inaccurate result may occur after 20 minutes. Interpretation of results positive, negative, invalid. Thank you for watching. The third assay we're going to show you is the Irobiology Crag LFA. Not very much is published about the performance of this assay. We hope this will be remedied soon. This is the Irobiology LFA, suitable for serum and spinal fluid. The procedure is relatively straightforward and each sample is vortexed prior to analysis. A separate tube is prepared for each sample and then the kit has all the reagents that you require apart from a pipette tip and a timer. Use a pretreatment solution for each sample. And you place one drop of this pretreatment solution into each additional tube for each sample that you will be running. then transfer 50 microliters of sample into each of these tubes using a separate pipette for each one. Each tube is closed. and labelled. It's important 
that you know which sample is which. And then each sample is then vortexed. You're now ready to start the assay. So take one of the case sets out from each foil bag and place it on the bench so that you can see the upper side. Label each cassette with the sample number so that again you're confident which sample is which. Then you take 50 macrolitres of each of these pre-treated samples and you place it into the well of each of these cassettes. Use a different pipette for each pipette tip for each sample. You then set the timer and it should read 10 minutes. And then you have to read the assay and you either get a positive or negative and we will then complete. There are positive and negative controls used and you can run these to check that the kits are working if you so wish. And this is a good idea for each new batch. Here the, the example of these is going to be run partly to show the control lines and the, the test lines. Again, these should be labeled so you know which one's which, but this should be obvious from the result. Again, this assay is run for 10 minutes with positive and negative controls. And here are some examples. You can see the positive control has got two lines, the negative control one line, and each of the zero samples that were run were both negative and both have a control line but not a test line. And the final assay we're going to show you of the LFA variety is the IMI LFA, which was the first to be launched on the market and is used extensively in Africa and other parts of the world. Cryptococcal meningitis is one of the deadliest opportunistic infections in HIV patients. It accounts for about half a million cases per year. Early detection is key to improving outcomes, and one of the ways to do this is by performing the cryptococcal antigen lateral flow assay, also known as the CRAG LFA on blood. And here is how to do it. Hello, how are you? First, clean the patient's finger with alcohol, then prick the finger with a lancet, place a small droplet of blood at the tip of the CRAG LFA. Then add one drop of specimen diluent into a reservoir. Insert the test strip into the reservoir. After 10 minutes, examine the strip and read the result. One line for control means negative. Two lines mean positive. Make sure the control line is visible, otherwise the test is not valid. It is important to wait the full 10 minutes because results are not always immediately clear 
especially in patients with low fungal burden. However, once two lines are visible, it is positive. Performing CRAG LFA enables healthcare workers to diagnose cryptococcal infection quickly and get a head start on management. More information is available on preventcrypto.org. Thank you for watching. The final section of our webinar is explaining how to interpret these tests and how to decide whether to quantify or not. We're next going to show you how you can actually produce a semi-quantitative answer from the IMI LFA because it is helpful in the field to sometimes know if you have a very high titer or, or not. And in patients who have iris syndromes or patients who have other problems where it's not clear whether they're responding well to therapy, this is sometimes really quite helpful. So there's a video showing how to do this semi-quantitative method. Following a positive result, the semi-quantitative procedure can be run to determine the titer of the specimen. Prepare dilution starting with an initial dilution of 1 to 5 and follow with two-fold serial dilutions up to 1 to 2560. First, place 10 micro centrifuge or test tubes in an appropriate rack and label them 1 to 10. Add 4 drops of lateral flow specimen diluent to tube number 1. Add two drops of specimen diluent to each of the test tubes labeled 2 through 10. Add 40 microliters of specimen to tube 1 and mix well. Transfer 80 microliters of specimen from tube 1 to tube 2 and mix well. Continue this dilution procedure through tube number 10. Discard 80 microliters from tube number 10 for a final tube volume of 80 microliters. You are now ready to submerge your tests. To reduce the total number of strips required for running the titer, we recommend following our titration algorithm. Begin by placing test strips in the tubes numbered 4, 7, and 10 and wait 10 minutes. These tubes will provide parameters for running the remaining dilutions. If tubes 4, 7, and 10 are negative, test tubes 1, 2, and 3. If tube 4 is positive and tube 7 is negative, test tubes 5 and 6. If tubes 4 and 7 are positive and tube 10 is negative, test tubes 8 and 9. If tube 10 is positive, perform more dilutions or report as greater than 1 to 2560. Conclude by reporting the titer as the last positive dilution. And then the interpretation of the cryptococcal antigen assay and if it's been quantified is going to be explained to you by Dr. Radha Rajasingham who has been involved in this area of research for a long time. Quantification of cryptococcal antigen titers. Our learning outcomes for today's presentation are to learn how to measure different cryptococcal antigen titers and report them, to understand the diagnostic value of CRAG titers, and to understand the value of cryptococcal antigen titers to monitor disease and or therapy. Throughout this presentation, I'll use the abbreviation CRAG which stands for cryptococcal antigen. How to measure CRAG titers. On the right, you can see the latex agglutination test. Two-fold dilution of CSF or serum using this latex agglutination test historically has been the conventional method for measuring cryptococcal antigen titers. But cryptococcal disease and HIV can yield very high titers, and this dilution becomes time consuming and expensive. Below is an image of the CRAG lateral flow assay, which is a more simple point of care test to detect cryptococcal antigen. Both the latex agglutination and the CRAG lateral flow assay can be quantified using titers. Both are performed using serial dilution. The titer is the last positive test before the dilution turns negative. Titers across the latex agglutination and lateral flow tests are not comparable. CRAG dilution series. Generating the most useful quantitative data of CRAG titer is not yet standardized. 
This table illustrates some options for dilution series. On the left is the conventional method of two-fold titers. On the right is the IMI recommended dilution series for the lateral flow assay. In the center is an example of a dilution series. We're using a threshold of 1 to 160 would minimize the need for multiple dilutions. We will shortly review the data behind this threshold of 1 to 160, as this is a clinically valuable threshold to guide management. What is the diagnostic value of Craig titers? The graph on this slide depicts the correlation between CSF cryptococcal culture on the y-axis and Craig lateral flow assay titers on the x-axis in HIV-infected persons in Uganda with cryptococcal meningitis. The culture in Craig titers results correlate strongly on day one of enrollment. This value of titer to predict quantitative culture decreased over time and was no longer seen seven or 14 days later. This figure highlights the strong correlation between Craig titer and CSF cryptococcal culture. Furthermore, Craig titer is associated with survival in HIV infected people. This figure combines four African cohorts of asymptomatic HIV infected people screened for cryptococcal infection and treated with fluconazole. Here we can see the effect of Craig titer on six month survival. Those with a high titer had low survival. Among asymptomatic Craig positive persons, Craig titers of 1 to 160 or greater are associated with increased mortality despite receiving standard of care antifungal therapy. From the same cohort, we see that in asymptomatic HIV infected persons, as serum Craig titer increases, the probability of CSF involvement increases. On the left panel, you can see that in asymptomatic persons with high Craig titers, those people are more likely to have subclinical cryptococcal meningitis. On the right panel, we see that as Craig titer increases, those with symptomatic Craig positive CSF increases, i.e. meningitis. Serum Craig titer of 1 to 160 or greater is predictive of meningitis with a sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 82%. How about cryptococcal infection in non-HIV infected patients? In this study of solid organ transplant recipients, 83% of those with pulmonary cryptococcal disease had a positive serum Craig test. Overall, 48% of these patients with a positive cryptococcal antigen had extrapulmonary disease compared to 13% of those with a negative Craig test. Craig titer was significantly higher in people who were fungemic compared to non-fungemic patients with pulmonary cryptococcosis. Craig was less likely to be positive in those with a single pulmonary nodule compared to those with multiple pul pulmonary nodules. Mortality at 90 days did not correlate with serum cryptococcal antigen positivity. Median Craig titer in patients who died was 1 to 256 compared to 1 to 64 in those who survived. In HIV inf uninfected people with cryptococcal meningitis, high CSF Craig titer at baseline is associated with sensory neural hearing loss, neurologic sequelae, cryptococcal meningitis relapse, and death. Finally, what is the clinical utility of monitoring Craig titer over time? Following up, follow up monitoring of Craig titer is not useful in HIV infected persons with cryptococcal meningitis. No difference has been seen in those who've had clinical response to treatment versus persistent disease or cryptococcal relapse. Furthermore, in HIV-infected people with asymptomatic cryptococcal antigenemia, change in serum or plasma Craig titer is not associated with survival. The figures below depict Craig titer values for patients with asymptomatic cryptococcal infection, both at baseline and six weeks thereafter. The left panel displays those who survived to six months follow-up 
and the right panel displays those who died before six months. There was no statistically significant difference in change in titers between those who survived versus those who died. To summarize, what is the value of cryptococcal antigen titers? Any positive CRAG in the serum, plasma, or CSF is associated with disease and needs evaluation and consideration of treatment. High titers in the serum at baseline are associated with meningitis, neurologic sequelae, and death in both HIV-infected and HIV-uninfected cohorts. In HIV-infected persons with asymptomatic cryptococcal antigenemia, high titers in the blood are predictive of subclinical meningitis and death. The best cutoff for predicting meningitis in HIV-infected persons is a titer of 1 to 160 or greater. Finally, there is no value in monitoring CRAG titers over time in HIV-infected persons with cryptococcal meningitis or asymptomatic cryptococcal infection. So in summary, the key elements of diagnosing cryptococcal disease include microscopy, histopathology, culture, biochemistry of the spinal fluid, radiology, and molecular identification or other identification of the organism that's grown. And the tests will vary depending on the disease manifestation and the sample type. But the more sensitive test and a more appropriate test in most circumstances, but not all, is the cryptococcal antigen test. You could use a latex agglutination, but also EIA or a lateral flow assay. And most people use the lateral flow assay for its simplicity and sensitivity. It's quick and it can be used semi-quantitatively and it's highly specific. And because the LFA requires minimal laboratory infrastructure, it's suitable for many um, low-income or middle-income environments. But it's also used in many high-income countries as a screening test prior to doing a semi-quantitative answer. A titer of more than 160 is suitable for diagnosing or is appropriate for diagnosing cryptococcal meningitis in an HIV patient. And it's always best to do a lumbar puncture. The benefit of lumbar puncture includes measuring the CSF pressure and also being able to sample the fluid to be sure that that is the right diagnosis. You can occasionally get false positives in blood, but not in spinal fluid with a cryptococcal antigen titer. And false negatives rarely occur because of poorly encapsulated varieties of cryptococcus. So David, first of all, something which does actually apply to some of these other lateral flow devices for other diseases is the stability of these devices at room temperature. This is quite critical, of course, in low resource countries where there are intermittent um, electricity supplies or there's no access to proper refrigeration. The tests, the devices that you've shown us, are these stable at room temperature? Uh, they are, and they have a long shelf life as well. What I don't recall is whether if you have extremely high temperatures, and I realize that in Iraq this week, this week or last week, they had temperatures of 46 degrees every day. I'm not sure whether the tests have been tested at that high temperature. If there's air conditioning available, that would be a good place to keep them. Now, um, another question is, as you may remember, a few years ago, there was a paper by, in fact, one of our former master's students um, in collaboration with the uh, University of Minnesota people in, in Uganda, looking at the suitability of saliva as a specimen type for cryptococcal antigen testing. Any comments about this? I'm not aware of any further papers that look, look, looked at this as an alternative specimen type. I don't think there are any further papers from that which Richard Cusera published. It's not as sensitive as a means of diagnosing uh, cryptococcal disease as uh, serum or panel fluid. Um, and I think it's inferior as well to, to urine, actually. Okay, some questions now from the audience. Which clinical sample is better for the lateral flow device? Serum from peripheral blood, I think they're asking. Is, is this the optimal sample? Yes, that's a perfectly good sample. You can also use a finger prick with some of the assays, as you saw with the IMI assay, so you don't even need to spin the blood. Plasma is also a useful sample for many of these as well.
Okay, another question here. This is going to be a bit tricky, I think, but um, the question is, of the three um, lateral flow devices that you showed us, which one do you think is the best? So there have been some comparisons of the Dynamica and the IMI compared with EIA, and they have a very similar uh, outcome. There is one study which suggests slightly better uh, sensitivity for the IMI assay. I know that the IMI assay also has explicitly got antibody present, which protects the antigen from other species of Cryptococcus, so GATI in particular, and that for some circumstances that may be helpful. Um, some of the assays are easier to read than others and the Dynamica assay is very easy to read which is which is helpful. And also we did there was a recent paper I think with the Biosynex assay and it was slightly less sensitive than the IMI assay as well. Okay thanks. Okay the questions are rolling in. Next one what is the interpretation of a low theta for example one in four one in eight? So in spinal fluid that means you have meningitis in serum, it's likely to represent an early phase of cryptococcemia, and that patient is much less likely to have uh, meningitis unless they have symptoms in HIV. In non-HIV patients, even low titers are very significant and uh, need to be addressed uh, as if the patient has a life-threatening cryptococcal infection. There are a very, there's a very small group of patients who are apparently normal from an immunological perspective who present with hydrocephalus and they have a chronic cryptococcal meningoencephalitis and they often have very low antigen titers, just undiluted positive or one to two. And it's important to take those patients seriously if you've got a situation, a, a sort of a neurosurgical type of patient with unexplained hydrocephalus. Okay, a question that's come through on the uh, on the chat is the Crag Tita value of 160 is this fixed or is the Tita does it vary from one different area of the world to another? The sensitivity specificity of that Tita for meningitis is around 85% sensitivity specificity, so it's not a perfect measure. And having a headache of any sort is also another means of assessing if a patient has cryptococcal meningitis. So both of these factors need to be taken into account. And if there's any doubt, then a lumbar puncture is the right thing to do, partly because you can then be confident about the best treatment for the patient, which will be amphotericin and flucytosine, and certainly the addition of flucytosine. If it's negative, then that uh, means the patient can be treated more without patient therapy and uh, fluconazole with or without flucytosine. A very general question that goes beyond the topic um, exactly of the of the webinar and um, interesting somebody's asking how can we differentiate between candida and cryptococcus in culture I think they're asking how can we recognize cryptococcal colonies from candida colonies growing on a laboratory culture plate I think that's the the meaning of the question so in a mixed culture, it, this is very difficult because they look very similar. Birdseed agar culture would differentiate because you get dark blue, dark brown or black colonies with cryptococcus, whereas candida does not change color. So you can, in a mixed culture context, distinguish the individual colonies. If you have a pure culture of a yeast and you don't know if it is cryptococcus or candida, of course, most candida species produce pseudohyphae, so a germ tube test is one approach to that. They, that will be negative on candida gabbrata. Candida gabbrata colonies tend to be very, very small pinpoint colonies, and so often experienced mycologists can distinguish those. And then, of course, there are biochemical and other means of distinguishing these organisms, such as an API strip or Multitoff or, or, or urease production and other features which you can use for identification. Somebody's asking here, somebody's alluding to the WHO guidelines on cryptococcosis. They're asking or they're telling us that the laboratory examination is not used as a monitoring method. I think they mean monitoring in response to therapy. What, what do you think about this? I agree with that in part. So in the context of a clinical trial of cryptococcal meningitis, repeated lumbar punctures are done and quantitative cultures are done, and that helps as a surrogate endpoint for the clinical trial. Often a repeat lumbar puncture is done anyway because patients have raised intracranial pressure, 
and a second lumbar puncture reduces mortality in patients with cryptococcal meningitis. So the second sample is usually retested, at least for culture. If you are later on in the course of cryptococcal meningitis treatment, sometimes patients can get an iris syndrome, and it can be difficult to distinguish iris from failing patient or a, a recurrent disease. And there, a, a cryptococcal culture is the most useful thing to do um, because the cryptococcal antigen will almost certainly be positive anyway. Now, a question for you. Can the CRAG test be used to, um, to detect antigens expressed by all species of cryptococcus beyond the aforementioned? Yes, it's certainly the most common ones. There are a number of rarer species like Laurentii and Unigatilatus. There's very little data on those, but I think they do produce antigen as well at lower concentrations, and they're rare, rare, rare causes of, of uh, meningitis. And the other tests are, do detect Cryptococcus gatti, although I know that the IMI test is particularly good at that because of the two antibodies that they use in the assay. Right. Somebody thanking you for your very nice um, continuing medical education video. There referring to a paper from Brazil that showed that preheating urine increased the sensitivity of the CRAG in HIV-infected patients. Do you know what cryptotita we would predict meningitis so that we can use this in a way as we do with the lumbar puncture CSF as an outpatient HIV clinic? Yeah, I don't. And I think urine, of course, is more or less dilute related to how much water has been consumed. So I think it would be unwise to try and choose a specific antigen titer for, for determining whether somebody has meningitis. I, I would be asking the patient if they have a headache or any other features of meningitis. And if they do, then I would def definitely do a lumbar puncture. If the urine was positive, but I would also test the blood, I think, to be sure, to determine if that's positive. And if the titer is very high in the blood, then that would also be an indication for doing a lumbar puncture. Uh, going back to the question about how do we differentiate between candida and cryptococcus on an agar culture plate, there are a number of comments, not questions, a number of comments about using bird seed agar and how you can recognize crypto colonies because of the, the dark colony that's formed uh, due to the, um, the presence of melanin in the cell, in the cell wall. So this is a good question, I think. How long after treatment would the CRAG teeter significantly change? So in patients with HIV, a serum CRAG titer is positive for months afterwards. This is probably because macrophage function is not very effective in patients with HIV, late stage HIV, and the antigen is a very large carbohydrate molecule that's taken up by macrophages. And that is, I think, a difficult thing to, to remove. In the spinal fluid, patients will be positive for weeks, possibly months, with cryptococcal antigen. It takes a long time to clear the yeasts from the spinal fluid. The antigen is taken up through the arachnoid granulations, and it takes, as I say, a long time for the microglial cells to actually dispose of the cryptococcus in the brain tissue and spinal fluid. So you'd expect a positive for a very long time. Right. Um, I think we'll, we'll conclude now. There's just one very general question here. Is there a cryptococcal management guideline available? Well, yes, there are American and European ones. Would you just like to have a final comment about where we can find these, these guidelines? Sure. So the WHO issued improved guidelines fairly recently for cryptococcal meningitis and all of the guidelines for every fungal disease that have been published that we can find are on a section of the LIFE website. Uh, if you go into the fungal infections section, there's a section called guidelines and you can uh, identify there all of the latest guidelines for every fungal disease. Okay. Thank you to all the uh, participants. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you to everybody for, for signing in. And thank you, David, for a wonderful webinar. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All the best, everybody.